Okay, so I just made this public. Um, cool, all right. Let's get started then. So, uh, hi everybody, my name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today, and it's time for your weekly space hangout for, oh, I'm gonna get my microphone closer, for uh, Thursday, September 27th, 2012. Now, this week, we have got a bunch of stories, and we don't have a lot of time, which is why we're kind of, kind of moving really quickly here. So uh, we've got a huge uh, telecon from NASA, uh, well maybe not huge, an important telecon from NASA starting up in about uh, in about 45 minutes and half of our reporting team is going to need to jump out and uh, and go and attend that to find out what interesting things have happened on on Mars now that Curiosity has, has zapped a bunch of rocks. So uh, we'll be uh, Sort of probably wrapping up or losing a bunch of people as we as we get to that. So so this week we're going to talk about the possibility that Comet Ison is going to be the brightest comet in uh, human history, in, in living memory. <laughs> um, a really cool new picture of Phobos that was returned from the Curiosity rover. We're going to have uh, the anticipated date for Felix Baumgartner's jump from. Uh, from 120,000 feet. Uh, the new Hubble Extreme Deep Field Survey was released. Uh, the first step for Grasshopper, uh, SpaceX's new uh, new spacecraft. Uh, the possibility of a base beyond the moon, uh, which would be really cool. Uh, and a new uh, paddle boat mission that might get sent to Titan. If we've got time, we've got a couple more stories. So like I said, we're going to go pretty quick today. Um, and uh, so why don't we just get started? So I think the first step is we're going to go to my good friend, so oh, I should introduce the people who are here. Uh, so uh, joining us as a, a disembodied picture uh, is uh, is Alan Boyle from NSM, um, from NBC's Cosmic Log. I have to get that into my memory now. It's no longer MSNBC, it's NBC. So can you hear us okay, Alan? Oh, I think he's muted himself. He's got his thumbs up. He's got. A, he's putting his. He's putting his yes. Work, yes, I have my thumbs up. Can you hear me? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Alan doesn't have his camera working today, but he is. Uh, he is still here in voice. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, so we've got Ian O'Neill from Discovery Space. We've got Jason Major from Lights in the Dark. We've got Mike Wall from Space.com, and we've got uh, Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. All right. So first up, let's talk with uh, with Ian uh, about Comet. Ison, and this is a uh, this could be the biggest story ever, or a uh, complete botch. So what's the what's the deal? <laughs> yeah, we just do not know. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, it, it's it's a weird one because it was actually announced on um, on the, the question boards on um, on Monday and Tuesday. The news really kind of broke, and everybody jumped on it. And Alan, uh, NBC, uh, Cosmic Log. Um, he, I think he was one of the first to break the news, so he's probably got more insight than I have. But, um, but yeah, basically, in a in a nutshell, um, this this assuming it's, it's a large a large comet that's been discovered just beyond the orbit of Jupiter, and what they did, what the astronomers did, they then looked at previous observations of that area, and they were able to um, deduce the comets. Um, orbital path, and it's actually going to come very, very close to the sun. Now, when comets get close to the sun, of course, they produce wonderful big tails, um, or that's the theory. And so, just because we found a comet, um, a lot of people are getting very excited about it. It's going to make a near pass of the sun in at the end of November 2013. So we've got some time to prepare for this. It's not going to come anywhere near Earth. Um, I've already had a couple of emails, um, you know, asking about that because obviously people get kind of scared when the comets start flying at you. Um, but it's going to come um, about 40% of the Earth's sun dis distance away from the Earth. So it's not going to come close at all. Um, but it could put on a very big show. Now, it could erupt and produce a wonderful long tail, so it would be subliming um, ices from, 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 the, uh, from the nucleus of the, of, the, of the comet, and it could produce a, um, a very impressive um, show. And, uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very interesting astronomical target, um, but it's not going to hit us. So, Right, but when it. you say... When you say, you know, interesting and could put on a show, I mean, you're kind of underselling it, right? Because the, you know, the descriptions yeah. that I've seen is is that 
you know, if everything goes right and it does make this close call to the sun, it's going to be 15 times brighter than the full moon? Well, yeah. I mean, the best case scenario is yeah. this is going to be historic. I mean, this historic, is going to be... Historic, yeah. The, the brightest yeah. comet in living Ever. history. Yeah. Ever. Ever, yeah. ever. And it, yeah, and it, could, it could be huge. But I think as soon as those headlines hit, um, a lot of astronomers said, hold on, you know, these are comets we're talking about. They're not, um, they're not a sure thing. And the thing is about this comet, um, there was some speculation that it could be a new comet. So it's freshly come from the Oort cloud, which surrounds our solar system about uh, within about one light year away. <laughs> Um, although there is no observational evidence that the Oort cloud exists, it, it, then it must be there because that's where a lot of comets seem to come from. <laughs> and it would appear that Ison uh, came from that area. And so there is some speculation that perhaps it's a new comet. So in other words, it's a pristine comet. It's it formed since the dawn of our solar system evolved. And for some reason, it's just careening through the solar, the solar system now. So it's very uncertain how it's going to react. Um, it could be a loosely packed comet uh, where it just fizzles and explodes very early when it gets too close to the sun, or it could be a very densely packed comet where it'll swing past the sun as if nothing happened, it'll just produce a small tail. But then again, it's a big comet, so it could flare up and it could produce a wonderful, majestic tail like mm. Halley's Comet. Um, we, the thing is, we don't know, and there's a fantastic quote, actually, I think, um, I, I don't know where I read it, but... Um, this uh, is a quote by, uh, I can't find it now, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back and try and find it, but um, there's a great quote, ah, here we go, uh, it's a quote from uh, David uh, Levy, of course he's the co-discoverer of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9, which crashed into, into Jupiter, um, but he said that comets are like cats, they have tails and they do whatever they want to do, and I think that's quite apt for comets, because we just don't know how it's going to react when it gets close to the sun, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is a classic example of the media taking something and running with it a little too far. Uh, so hopefully we can give everyone here a little bit of context. It could be the greatest comet we've ever seen, and it might be completely fizzled out and be nothing, and you'll never hear about it again. So, you know, somewhere, this, this is, somewhere in between. The, here's the disembodied voice. Uh, uh, it's, it's just that it's very early in the cycle. Uh, and so, as Ian said, uh, it depends on the composition of the comet and and uh, what happens to it. There was a lot of talk about Comet Elenin, the supposed doomsday comet, and and uh, there was never any chance of any doomsday. But uh, there was the hope that there would be a good show, and that fizzled out because Elenin ba basically broke apart before it could make any sort of display. The neat thing about this comet is that it will be visible from the northern hemisphere. That uh, that. We've had some great comets in the past few years, like Comet Lovejoy and, and Comet McNaught, and those were visible from the southern hemisphere, but we couldn't get in on the show, us northerners. This one, we'll be able to see. It's going to be in the constellation Virgo, and it, it, if, if it does uh, go toward the high end of expectations, it'll be brighter than the full moon and uh, visible uh, in evening skies, uh, actually in morning skies, uh, early in the cycle in, in November 2013, and then in evening skies later in the cycle, December 2013. And so it could be a fantastic Christmas comet for, for 2013. But again, it's very early. We're going to see lots of stories about this comet from now until then. Perfect. All right. Well, let's move on. Uh, so the next thing I think is is one of the most dramatic pictures. I think you know I'm calling it one of the most dramatic space pictures of the year. Uh, you might uh, disagree with me. And this is an amazing picture from the surface of Mars, taken by the Curiosity rover of Phobos. And I'm going to pass this along to Jason. But hopefully, Jason's got the the image queued up so we can all see it. I do. I've got it right here. Um, so what this is, and I'll just I'll just pop it up on the screen. <laughs> I hope this people can so see cool. it. Can you make it out? Yeah. Now, can yeah. you can you actually zoom in to, to the? Uh, uh, well, the moon? I'm using the uh, the Google. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So I can't really do that. Um, I can try to screen share it though. Let me let me try that. Sure. Um, and I'll put a I'll put a link into the into the comments over on Google Plus so people can people can see it because it's just a phenomenal okay. picture. All right. So and I should be able to uh, zoom in here. 
It's easy. So it's a crescent Phobos, yeah? It, what it is, it's, yeah. if you look up at the, if you see the moon in the daytime sometimes, you know, uh, uh, here from Earth, you look up and you see the crescent moon or the, you know, gibbous moon, and it'll be, have that blue cast. Well, this is basically the same thing that's happening from Mars with its moon Phobos. That's great. I mean, this was captured, um, I want to say it was a few days ago, by Curiosity's mass cam. And, I mean, you would have missed it in the original image. But there, you know, it, it, there it is. It's right there. Um, it's getting lit by the, um, I think it was the setting sun. And, I mean, that's just, that's just gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, and that was it. I mean, it's just, it looks, you know, at a glance, it really seems really familiar that it's this image of a, of a crescent, of a crescent moon. But when you look really close at it, you can see that it has this, this has sort of, yeah. it has a shape, this asteroid shape, and you can kind of see the Terminator. And yeah, like I said, when I, when I saw this picture, I just, I couldn't believe it. And, and I'm sorry, the Hangout just isn't doing it justice. So, um, you know, by all that. means, go do a search for Phobos picture on Google, and I'm sure you'll you'll come to it. Yeah, so. well, I mean, if you jump on Universe Today, it's um, it's one of the uh, one of the articles. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, so so, I mean, there's not a lot of science there, but it's just a beautiful picture. <laughs> but also, that's what an asteroid would look like as it's approaching Earth. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> In the so daytime. Just so just the sky, my head. Right. From an asteroid strike. <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled to the sky and see if you see that, you are about to die. Um, uh, okay, great. Well, let's move on. Like I said, we're, we're, we're moving fast here today. Uh, so we've got uh, a scheduled date for uh, Felix Bumpgartner's uh, jump from 120,000 feet. Uh, Mike, you've been reporting on this one? Yeah, yeah. It's going to happen October 8th if all goes according to plan, which I guess is a week from this coming Monday. And um, basically, he's going to go up on a hot air balloon from... Uh, yeah, I mean, southeastern New, like New, yeah, new uh, Mexico, I think, and get up to 120,000 feet, which is about 23 miles. He's got this specially built capsule that's all to kind of keep him safe and warm um, like until he gets up to that altitude. Then he'll step out at about 23 miles above the Earth, and he'll just come hurtling down through the atmosphere um, during the free fall, if all keeps going well, he'll break the sound barrier, he will set a bunch of records, not only highest skydive, but also, I mean, longest free fall, fastest free fall, highest manned balloon flight, and if everything continues to go well all the way to the ground, then he will not die, and um, that's what everybody hopes will happen, but yeah, so it's, yeah, he, I mean, he's been sort of in building up to this, I mean, he had another jump from about 97,000 feet about two months ago, late, yeah, yeah July 25th, I think it was, and he was hoping to get this jump sooner than it's going to happen now, but, but during that, that, that sort of practice run, he actually damaged that capsule a little bit, and he had to take some time to, to repair it. But yeah, so if, if all continues to go well, then, then kind of keep your eyes peeled on October 8th, because he's, he's, like, he's going to be taking video the entire time, I think, so that video would be pretty amazing to watch. There will be awesome pictures coming from that, too. And, um, oh yeah, I didn't even yeah. think about that. Yeah, he's gonna. Yeah. I'm sure a, a video will be released of the entire descent, and it's gonna. Oh yeah. Yeah, and, and somebody mentioned on on uh, Google Plus that he should he should be wearing Google glasses. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. I mean, and yeah, there's a good question about what what this is, right? I mean, it's it's kind of a stunt because I mean, this guy is a a, a daredevil. He's jumped off of some of the highest buildings in the world. I mean, he jumped across the English Channel wearing a, a wingsuit. Um, so it's partially just he wants to set records, and it's a There's some science going on here, too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, some of his mission officials say that, I mean, he could be gathering data that, that you know, NASA engineers could conceivably use to, to you know, sort of, like, ensure safe, safe escapes from a fast-moving spacecraft in the upper atmosphere or something like that. I mean, I don't know if that if that's really that valid or if they just want to put kind of I don't know, I mean, a scientific veneer kind of on it, too, but it's just, it's cool. It's really strange and cool, and it's going to be pretty dramatic, so it's just something to, to, to sort of keep an eye out for. you got to respect the marketing wizards at Red Bull for coming yeah. up with these ideas. I mean, yeah, they yeah. could not have, you know, the better bang for their buck. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning. I mean, Red Bull Stratos is is the actual name of, of the mission. I mean, Red Bull is sponsoring it, and they've they've been calling it a jump from the edge of space or a, a space jump. Those are some of the terms that have been used. It's it's kind of worth pointing out. Space is generally considered to start about sixty two miles above the Earth, and he is going to be at twenty three. So it's not really a space jump, but it's high enough. 
<laughs> it's actually high enough up that it's um it's still pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that I think that's what we would describe it as pretty crazy. Yeah. Um people are wondering how long it's going to take for the whole descent, do you know? Does anybody know? I'm actually not sure. I'm sure that that yeah, the information is probably out there. I'm not entirely sure. Most it's it's definitely going to go fast because if he 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 breaks the sound barrier, he's going to be he's going to be covering that ground pretty quickly. And I mean, I don't think he's going to open his chutes until he's fairly close to the ground. So it'll it'll probably be over within like ten or twelve minutes. I'm I'm guessing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, let's move on. Uh, again, I apologize for the rapid fireness of this, or maybe this is what people prefer. I don't know. Uh, so, so we're going to move on. So, uh, Hubble Space Telescope—they have released the new extreme deep field, and I know Nancy, you worked on the story. Sure. Yeah. Some of the most iconic images that we've gotten from Hubble so far have been some of the deep field images they've done the original deep field and then the ultra deep field, and these are just kind of. Uh, where they zoom into what looks like an empty region of space in the sky, and it's kind of just like a very small grain of sand size portion of the sky. Well, now done the extreme deep field, and uh, this again just zooms into uh, where they zoomed into before, and it took them 10 years to actually uh, gather all the data that they used to create this image, and let me see if I can screen share it here. Um. But uh, yeah, no, I know the. Uh, but the first one was the deep field, and then there was the ultra deep field, and right. now there's the extreme. So the the first one was back in 1995, and then the the ultra deep field was in 2004, and now they've released the uh, the 2012 the extreme deep field the XDF, and this was done with yeah. two million seconds of telescope time. And right. it's a portion of the moon. I'm trying to think. If you can imagine my microphone is the moon, the portion that they did is sort of like this this little switch here. It's about the amount of space that they're gazing into. So right. it's sort of and like within, a neg Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, and, and, with, and within that image, there are uh, over 5,000 galaxies, about 5,500. Um, somebody pointed out that there are three stars in there only. <laughs> And uh, and again, it was is ten years of observing time, uh, basically put together. Uh, it was just just awesome. I mean, these the first ones were inspiring just because of how people looking and the amazing amount of galaxies that are in the images. And this one just you know takes it off the charts. It's just mind blowing, basically. And the, I think the oldest galaxy in there is like thirteen point two billion light years away. Like only half a billion years after the Big Bang, so yeah, I wasn't sure. I can't wait for the James Webb to come along and do the I don't know what they'll call it, the James Webb Mega Deep Field Survey or something, and they'll <laughs> find another zoom. superlative. Yeah, they'll find another superlative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it sounds like those telescope names, the you know, the overwhelmingly large telescope, the mind-bogglingly <laughs> large telescope. So, I mean, the, so yeah, the wicked deep field. The wicked deep field, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I don't know what to say. You know, it's an it's a massive amount of telescope time. I mean, it's one of the primary things I think that Hubble's been working on is this this one picture. So, so love it, people. Um, yay, Hubble. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Uh, SpaceX's Grasshopper has taken a first step. Uh, Ian, you worked on the story, right? Yeah, uh, actually, I've had some interest in it. We ran an article on it uh, in the week. Um, of course, uh, the grasshopper concept is um, SpaceX's answer to um, reusable uh, booster rockets to put stuff into space, and that's really the holy grail of um, of getting stuff into space. You know, making it cheaper, making it reusable, making it uh, greener, uh, making it um, you know more lower cost. And really, this is what SpaceX is trying to focus on. It's very hard. That's why nobody's really actually achieved it yet. Even the shuttle. I mean, admittedly. Is a reusable orbiter, and they reuse the um, booster rockets on each side of the um, the shuttle when it when it went up. But it would take a lot of refurbishment. I think they had a turnaround of like a month to year, a year to actually refurbish these uh, booster rockets. And of course, it was you needed an army of people to make this system reusable. So it wasn't technically reusable. 
Um, so SpaceX, they got a different idea. They want to put um, stuff into space using a reusable rocket, and this grasshopper is a concept right now, and it's kind of cool, and it's kind of odd when you actually see it happening. Um, they are basically testing it in Texas at the moment, and the first test went without hitch uh, last week, and I think if it's if my internet's going to cope with it okay, I've got a video that I can share. Um, see if and it's not, yeah, it should, should, should work. Let's see. Um, and it, it doesn't really um, show an awful lot because really the camera is obscured by, um, by smoke when, when, the, when the rocket actually goes off. But according to SpaceX, the, uh, the rocket actually, um, from, from standing, took off six foot, hovered, and then came back down again. But it wasn't really a hover, it just went up, went down again. But here's the video. Let's see if it works. And it goes, lots of smoke, and it's down again. So really, that was it. It was like, come on, we can well, look it's it's right. on, it's back on the ground again. It didn't work. <laughs> hey, did, did you miss that? Do you want to see it again? <laughs> <laughs> if you if you squint really hard, you'll see it. You ready? You actually see the struts leave the ground. Here we go. There we go. Uh, uh, no. Oh, and, and it's got stuck in his back. But yeah, <laughs> apparently, apparently, um, what, you want to see it do it again? <laughs> I think let's do it again. Yeah, this needs to be part of loop, really. Okay, so yeah, you do actually see the struts straighten out. So we assume that it took off six foot. I mean, that, that's the official line anyway. So yeah, so that's all good. Um, so, but what does this mean, right? I mean, is this it? Are we now on to our future of a completely reusable spacecraft? Um, am I am I sharing it still? Is it gone? No, you're not. I'm back. I'm back. You're cool. Um, yeah. yeah, we're back to you. Yeah. So, the, so this is really the first step, and um, SpaceX has been give, given clearance by the FAA now to carry out these hover tests. So, this is the first um, flash. Uh, the first six foot. Now they're going to go up to a few hundred meters, hopefully, and and I think they're going to top out at like eleven thousand foot um, it, during these tests. And, and apparently, the tests are going to take like three years. Um, they're confident it's going to happen, and ultimately, this is this the the, the Grasshopper launch vehicle will um, form the bedrock of their uh, reusable launch system. So basically, the, you'll have the payload on top of this rocket. It'll launch. And then once the first stage um, separates, it will come back to Earth in a controlled fashion and hover back to the launch pad. And then the, the plan is they can actually turn it around within hours for, wow. for a relaunch, if yeah. needs be. So this is one hell of an improvement on anything like the, like the shuttle program. But ultimately, it's, it's a lofty goal. But you know, Elon Musk and SpaceX, they're not really too scared of lofty goals at the moment. And they seem to be succeeding. Yeah. So. Who knows? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't well, bet I against. Yeah, I wouldn't bet against Elon Musk at this point. Absolutely not. Uh, oh, fantastic. Okay, cool. All right. Well, let's let's move on. So, um, Alan's picture. Uh, you've got a story about a NASA's plans for a base beyond the moon, and this kind of came out of left field. I didn't hear a lot of sort of story on this. What happened? What's this about? Well, actually, they've been talking about this for for quite some time. It's just that uh, there is an uh, another little spin or another suggestion that maybe NASA is taking this more seriously. Uh, the idea is to set up uh, the next space station after the International Space Station as uh, an outpost actually beyond the orbit of the moon. It's at a gravitational balance point called L2 and that's where the Earth and the moon's gravitational forces add up so that you have kind of a stable orbit this the this uh, outpost could remain uh, just just beyond the moon, uh, and uh, you could have folks go there uh, as a staging point for missions to the moon or outward missions to a Mars or an asteroid. And so this has been part of the architecture that's been debated for quite some time uh, for beyond Earth orbit exploration. And it's just that uh, NASA apparently is discussing this th with the White House now as a potential step. It's called the Exploration Gateway um, Platform. And, and so uh, the idea is that uh, the new launch vehicles, uh, for example, the SLS, uh, would could send 
hardware out there. In fact, you don't actually need the SLS to start sending the hardware out there, but you would eventually need a heavy lift rocket in order to uh, bring astronauts out there and to kind of have traffic back and forth to this L2 station. So it's been really talked about for years and years. Buzz Aldrin suggested putting a station at L1 back in, gosh, 1997 or so. And, and so uh, there happened to be a space flight conference in Seattle over the weekend. And, uh, and Buzz was uh, saying, well, this is exactly what I've been talking about. And a lot of other astronauts feel like this is the way to go, too. It's really part of the flexible path, what they call uh, a, a strategy for getting beyond Earth orbit that allows you to, to, to go various places. Uh, but the time frame and the cost are still to be determined. And, and that's the big issue with this, is that people have not really been able to nail down those costs. It, it doesn't look very good for NASA in future years in terms of getting a lot more money. So that's where the real sausage making, if you will, of this exercise uh, is going to begin. Uh, there were indications uh, from this, uh, this report in the Orlando Sentinel that uh, there may be some sort of a decision to move forward with this plan. That's what NASA would like to do. But it's really up to the White House to, to decide uh, how much they're going to give. And, and we may not hear a lot more about this until February when, when the next budget is, is released. But it's intriguing. It's something that kind of turns on the people who are thinking, well, what are we going to do next in space? Uh, this is an intermediate step that could take people eventually to asteroids or Mars or the moon, uh, wherever. So uh, it's, it's uh, great to have in the mix, but don't expect a big announcement about the L2 space station uh, until, you know, months uh, down the line. So apparently, I apologize for the people watching this, uh, Alan is not even a disembodied head. He is just a blank white screen. So uh, if you're seeing this white screen as voice coming out, uh, at least you have his voice. So, um, and we'll, we'll figure out this technically for, for next it, week. It's for Halloween, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, and I'm it's sorry about that. As, as other people have been talking, I've been trying to figure this out and have not figured it out. Don't, do yet. not worry about it. Even your voice is, is all we need to hear. <laughs> um, that may be the best part. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, okay, so, so clearly this, you know, I am conflicted. I'm ambivalent on the one hand, uh, a base at L2 uh, ushers in our Star Trek era with humans beyond the moon and, you know, now flying off to other planets. The pessimist in me says if NASA is going at its budgets with the chainsaw already um, and still can't even make it back to the moon uh, and look at the debacle of the International Space Station what are the chances that this is even going to happen forget about it are they just I don't know trying to I don't know I'm sad and and I'm conflicted. So so set me straight. What do you think? Do you, do you think... I think you're typical. You're a typical yeah. person when when it comes to this. Is that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, the Senate, uh, people call the space launch uh, system the Senate launch system sometimes because it was really, it really came out of the senator's desire to have this big project. And so uh, it, it really depends, first of all, on what the White House proposes and then also on what Congress uh, wants to do. I think the money could be there if the Senate uh, in particular latches on to this project as kind of the next big thing. Uh, and uh, if it's portrayed as something that really plays to the strengths of the SLS. Of course, there are, are people, for example, in SpaceX who say, well, we could do this a lot more cheaply using the commercial launch vehicles that we're pioneering. And so uh, I think another scenario that you might like, might like uh, Fraser, would be that uh, SpaceX and other commercial operations take this ball and run with it and say, well, here, this is the way we can do it instead of a uh, hundred billion, uh, just give us, uh, you know, X billion and, and we'll do it for you. Uh, so it's going to play into that same old debate of commercial big space. I think that's a really good point. You can imagine this sort of new future where NASA expresses vague 
interest and then commercial providers come along and say okay fine you know it'll only cost you three billion or whatever and then they go ahead with it so I think that's that, that's really interesting you've restored my hope good in, in everything um, mission accomplished <laughs> so someone asked what is what are l1 and l2 and I thought I'd just explain that briefly those are uh, places around gravitational bodies like the moon or like the earth which um, are almost like hills that you can sort of drop or valleys that you can drop into that are very gravitationally stable and so they don't require a lot of energy to um, to sort of to maintain your position once you're in them and so it's you could it's almost like a uh, you know you can imagine a little I don't know, like a little valley, and you'd put a ball in it, and every time you roll the ball up one part of the hill, it's just going to roll back down to the bottom. And so there are these places. Here's the places. Are, there, there, there are there the places. Yeah, yeah, here are the places. So you can see here that there's the sun, there's the earth, there's the moon, and then beyond them is L2, and it is this gravitationally stable place that you could you could drop a, a space station and it would just sit there no fuel required at that point and so they're very exciting places to right you see as one actually uh, and I should point out that that uh, diagram shows the gravitational balance points for the Sun and the Earth so we're not talking about L2 in the Sun Earth system we're talking about L2 in the Earth Moon system but the principle is the same yeah, there is a there is a set of these these Lagrange points for you know almost all of the you know interactions. So there's going to be like an L two between the Sun and Jupiter, and it's going to be L two between and so on. So exactly. uh, anyway, why don't we uh, why don't we move on? Um, Nancy, you've got a story that just came out today. So this is fresh off the press, <laughs> which is a proposal to send a paddle boat to Titan. So am I going to get my Mar my Titan boat? Yeah, you might. You might. Uh, this week is the European Planetary Science Congress, and there's a lot of great papers and presentations coming out this week. Um, it's This is in uh, Madrid, Spain. But anyway, one of the more intriguing presentations to come out was uh, a boat for Titan. And uh, what they are working on is kind of in-situ propulsion, uh, meaning how are they going to, they're going to land on a lake in tight, on Titan and uh, just kind of somehow traverse across the lake. And... Uh, take samples and do science along the way. So it's called the Titan Lake In-Situ Sampling Propellant Explorer, or TALIS. And uh, they've got a, what they're basically working on is the, the propulsion system and for getting across these lakes. And um, uh, you know, they've come up with a few ideas for what would work the best, but you know, it, it's going to be a huge technological challenge I think because of how cold it is on Titan and if a lot of work has been done with moving having moving parts inside these hydrocarbons that are in the that, that make up the lakes on Titan so um, they've got a few ideas for uh, how they could propel across the uh, across these lakes they've got um, inflatable wheels or uh, a screw type um, system or paddles which I think I mean I've got a paddle boat at our lake and it's just you know it's so <laughs> it's so crazy to think of a boat doing that on Titan um, but they also have some other ideas uh, like a, a hovercraft or I'm thinking of these you know airboats uh, in the uh, Everglades in Florida and uh, so it's, it's pretty enticing but this is a very very early stage proposal I think they classified it as a phase zero proposal and it's coming from a uh, aerospace engineering firm in Spain along with uh, uh, their astrobiology uh, center in Spain and um, they're you know they're just trying to be ready for the next time there's a call for proposals for a mission to to uh, to Jupiter to to Titan and uh, you know they they just want to be ready well I'm gonna, I would like to propose sailboat so I think, you know, you just, I'm sure there's wind on Titan. They got good atmosphere. I would, uh, yeah, I think that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, uh, I seem to be losing my connection here. I hope I don't disappear. Um, so why don't we move on then uh, to Mike again. Uh, you've got a story you're working on about the Mars sample return mission, the latest, the latest edition. Yeah, well, this is another story that's, you know, decades off basically in terms in terms of what's actually going to, to be launched and what's going to happen. But just get the Tuesday, basically, I mean, NASA 
had they kind of put together a group this past March after like a lot of their the funds for the the you know, you know, the planetary science and exploration basically had been cut by about twenty percent and and um, they basically needed to to restructure their Mars program and kind of what they're going to do and and kind of how they're going to do it within this new budget environment and so they they put together this group called the Mars Program Planning Group that would say what are our chief priorities at Mars, how do we kind of meet these, those priorities within the, the, the new fiscal situation. And on Tuesday, that group came back with its report. And that they basically said, you know, NASA should be gearing up. I mean, all of their, their top priorities should be to go get some chunks of Mars rock or soil and bring them back to Earth. That should sort of drive all of the robotic exploration of Mars in the near term. And so basically NASA is now going over all the options that, that, that were laid out in this report for how to do that and we could hear what sort of path they choose to go down maybe in about three or four months. I mean February is is another good date where, where you may hear it because obviously I mean that's, that is when the, uh, the, the 2014 budget comes out from the White House. So there are a few different options for ways to do this you know they could do it in like one launch, two launches or three launches what they need to do is put a sampling rover down on Mars that would basically cruise around to a good spot where there was once water and was once some you know, some kind of like energy source that could have supported life, and um, they they need to have what what they call in the report, um, it, I mean a Mars ascent vehicle (MAV) which would take the samples and blast it off the surface, and they also need to have an orbiter that would be circling Mars while this is going on, or or could get there a little later. And to, so, so it could actually snag that sample as it has come off the surface of Mars and sort of grab it and then, then yeah, take it back to Earth or to the, the, the sort of neighborhood of Earth where, where it could be grabbed by another craft and brought back down to our planet. So, like, it, yeah, I mean, as, like, as you can imagine, this is fantastically complicated and would be very expensive, but um, this is what, what yeah, NASA has said they are going to to be working toward, and they've they've also said that their first, yeah, you know, like the first launch opportunity, basically to to like get this 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 process going is 2018, and they they might be able to pull off something in 2018, but but they don't have enough money for the rover at that point. So if they launch something in 2018, it would be the yeah, in Mars orbiter maybe, and but if they if they push that launch opportunity back to 2020, which is that like very next opportunity, then that might be the first time where like they could launch the sampling rover, but all these things it's it's still yeah very very early days. They're trying to figure out what path they want to go down, how many launches they want to use, what the timeline is. But but basically why we're talking about it now is because I mean they just got the final report back from that group that has said this is what we think you should be doing, and these are some some options for for how to get some get yeah, Mars soil and rocks back to Earth. And yeah, I mean, it's just worth saying. You know, it's it, it's it's probably obvious, but yeah, scientists want to get these these little pieces of soil and rock back on Earth so that they can scrutinize them very carefully. Scientists here on Earth in their labs can do a lot more experiments on these things than say, I mean, a rover could do on Mars. So it's 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 strongly regarded as one of the best ways to actually determine if if the, yeah, life did once exist on on Mars is is to have real life scientists back back here on Earth looking through this stuff. So yeah, I mean, it's still very early days, and it will be. I mean, I've heard cost projections for the total project between five billion and, and yeah, ten billion dollars, and, and there's a problem. Tough. Yeah, that's tough. NASA. I mean, any kind of multi-billion-dollar project NASA is considering is is always tough because they don't have that much money these days. But. And they'll already be building that L two space station, <laughs> right. uh, returning people to the surface of the moon, and. Um, and floating Titan boats. Yeah, well, that's that's what's frustrating for for yeah, for those of us who just like really love NASA and space exploration. And there are so many great targets, right? And there are so many amazing projects: Titan paddle boat, the you know, L two space station, Mars sample return. And how do you do that if your space agency gets like point four or five percent of the federal budget? I mean, there's just it's it's a very big place, space, and they don't there's not enough money to to do all the cool things that people want to do. And I think the problem is is that it's so easy to come or I mean there's so many amazing ideas. I mean you just hear these fantastic ideas all the time and and yet it's difficult to fund any of them and so you you end up with ninety percent of the fantastic ideas just 
you know getting cut out of the budget. So I mean, and, it's and, and what's well, and, and and what's tough too about something like Mars sample return? I mean, it's it's very much multi-step and could take ten to twenty years. And anytime you talk about sustaining funding for a project that lasts a decade or two, I mean, it's subject to, to whims of the current administration or the Congress and. It's tough to to put a project of that scope in in motion and to keep it supported for a couple of decades. That's just that's just a tough tough ask. Now it's uh, it's quarter to eleven, and and I want to give you guys fair warning. If you need to dit, you know duck out and attend the uh, prepare for the NASA conference, whoever needs to go, uh, does anybody need to to check out? I'll, I'll probably need to go in about five minutes. I think in five minutes. Okay. All right. Well then. Then uh, put your hand up when you're ready to go, so I can make sure that we say goodbye properly, as opposed yeah. to you having to drop out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so then, one uh, then we got time for one last story, and then one quick conversation. So the last story I wanted to talk about, and this one comes from Jason, is the uh, I guess the discovery, the analysis of the enormous halo of gas that surrounds the Milky Way. Yeah, in fact, I'll uh, I'll try to keep this I'll try to keep this quick and uh, and in scale here. Um, oh, picture picturey. All right, there it is. Here we go. There's a there's a huge cloud of ionized plasma. It's very hot. It's very big. It's not very dense, and it surrounds our entire galaxy and the smaller Magellanic galaxies that uh, that orbit ours. So that's what they found using um, using data from Chandra's X-ray observatory, uh, NASA's Chandra X-ray observatory, and they found this. Let me shut this off here. Um, they found this through the emission. What happens is when they're when they're looking at distant X-ray sources, the X-rays that are coming in, um, you know, across across millions of light years, these X-rays are coming into our galaxy and they're getting absorbed uh, at certain frequencies, at certain wavelengths, by oxygen ions inside this gas cloud. It's a, um, I mean, the gas cloud is very hot. It's 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 one to two and a half million Kelvin. Uh, that equates to about several hundred times, um, hundred times the surface. Uh, of our sun's temperature, so I mean it's it's really hot. But the strange thing is, is it doesn't emit um, infrared radiation. It doesn't it doesn't emit heat like we would perceive it. So to think about you know how the heat works is a little bit is a little strange. But you know it is a very very hot cloud of gas. And what's interesting is this may be where the missing matter in our galaxy is hiding. It's in this huge cloud that spans. Um, hundreds of thousands of light years. Um, I guess there's there was a way for researchers to figure out how much how many atoms there would have been in the universe and in the galaxy ten billion years ago. And with current estimates, they look at that and they, they look what's out there now and they say, you know what, some of this stuff's missing. There's forty, fifty percent of that matter missing. Where is it? And now that they've found and now that they've they've confirmed um, you know, to, to a reasonable extent, they've confirmed evidence of this cloud. It's probably sitting out there, and these cl this cloud of material may actually extend out into the local group of galaxies. And who knows, it might even connect uh, connect galaxies within our local group. Um, so, one last thing. Actually, I got two last things. One is I don't know if any of our UK viewers caught a chance of seeing that meteor that went across the sky in uh, in the UK over the over the weekend. Uh, it was quite a sh sight, and some amazing videos and imagery of that. And uh, I'd love to hear any firsthand accounts if anyone saw it. Um, and then the other thing is uh, Endeavor was transferred to Los Angeles a couple of days ago. Uh, did anybody see it? Mike, you're in. You're in. Yeah, you're in LA area, aren't you? I muted you, Mike. You're. You got to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm actually based in San Francisco, but I did go down to, to LA for the arrival of Endeavor, and yeah, it was it was it was pretty cool. I mean, I I'd, I'd never seen up up close a space shuttle flying on the back of a 747, so it's just a very strange, you know, bizarre, surreal sight to see that happen. And it was it was it was cool. You know, I mean, it's that's not the end of the road for Endeavor. It still has to take a crazy 12 mile journey through the streets of LA to get to its museum home. And that's going to take place actually October 12th through 13th. It's going to take two days to cover the 12 miles along the, the streets of the city, which is going to be even more surreal and even more bizarre. Yeah, and Ian, you were stuck in traffic, and so you didn't see it. Yeah, I actually live here. <laughs> I missed it, <laughs> which sucks. So we're, we're shooting around town trying to see, catch a glimpse of it, but um, unfortunately, every place we went to, we'd already missed it, and we couldn't get down to the airport on time. Yeah. It sucks. 
Um, but I'm glad so, Mike was there. Yeah, well, well, you know, I took some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, some beautiful videos and some pictures. It's great. I did a I did a search on YouTube as the flyover was happening for shuttle. Um, and then I was just seeing everyone's live video as they were posting their, their videos. And so you, I, you could see, like, oh, it just flew over our house in San Francisco. Oh, we just saw it go past the Golden Gate Bridge. And you could see the videos coming onto YouTube in kind of reverse chronological order as the, as the shuttle was making its, its way across the, uh, the area. It was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, I really wish I would have seen it. And I still want to go to see the, uh, to the California Science Center uh, once they've got mm-hmm. it set up because it's not just going to be a shuttle sitting on the ground. It's going to be the full stack. It's going to be the shuttle. It's going to be the SRBs. It's going to be the fuel tank. It's going to be mounted vertically, and you'll be yeah. able to stand and like look up at the shuttle. So well, that's so, and that's yeah, that's that's what they're going to do. I mean, that yeah, that's what it's eventually going to be. But that but but I mean, the permanent exhibit where it's going to be vertical and launch position and surrounded by the the boosters and the tank and everything. That's probably going to be ready in like 2017 or so. They're they're now doing I mean a temporary exhibit which is going to open October 30th and. It's not going to be quite that cool, but I mean, it'll it'll still be the, the the space shuttle, and you can you can see it up close. And but but yeah, they are working to to like to get that final one and where it's in launch position and everything, and that'll probably be ready by 2017. Road trip. I'm thinking yeah. road trip. Yeah. We'll do a big we'll do a big party at the uh, when they get it all set up in 2017. That'll just be phenomenal. Yeah. Okay, well I'm going to let everybody go on this sort of shortened, but we actually got a lot of news done, so I'm actually pretty happy. Maybe this is the format. Uh, so I'm going to let you go first, Michael Wall from Space.com. Uh, I guess we can find out more about you from Space.com. Where are you on the Twitters? Um, I'm actually Michael D. Wall at Twitter. I don't, like, I don't post as, as much as I should, but, but I am there. So. <laughs> but mostly, you know, you just follow the Space.com RSS feed and we'll see yeah. most of your stories. Yeah, yeah. You write about half of them, so... Well, well, there aren't that, that many of us at space.com, so we all get a, get a pretty big piece of the pie. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, like I said, I've, I'm amazed at the phenomenal amount of writing that you do. I'm, I'm oh, in thanks. awe. So it's great to have you. It was great to see you, and, uh, and good luck with the telecon. Keep okay, us posted. Thanks, guys. See you all later. Right. See ya. Um, we got Ian O'Neill from Discovery Space, and how do we find out more of Ian O'Neill? Um, just uh, mainly on Discovery News, uh, so discoverynews.com, uh, also my personal blog, astroengine.com, and you can find me on Twitter at Astro Engine. Perfect. Jason Major, lightsinthedark.com. Yes, I run around the internet, um, and you can find me at lightsinthedark.com. You can find me at Twitter at JP Major. You can also find me at Universe Today and Discovery News. And of course, my uh, partner in crime, Nancy Atkinson at Universe Today. Yep, Universe Today. You can find me at the NASA Lunar Science Institute podcast. Uh, Twitter, I'm Nancy underscore A. Um, and the next thing that we're going to be doing is Thursday today. So the next thing is going to be our virtual star party on Sunday night. Uh, we'll be doing that. It's a live broadcast uh, from a whole bunch of telescopes streaming in to a Google Plus Hangout. We'll be, uh, it's going to be a full moon, so we'll get that. We'll probably get Jupiter and then a bunch of uh, deep sky objects that are totally washed out by this almost full moon. So it should be a, an interesting night. And that's uh, Sunday night as soon as it gets dark on the West Coast. So we typically start around 7.30 or so. Um, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for watching and uh, putting up with our shortened version of this. Really appreciate it. And we will see you all next week. <laughs>